Yes, I am so glad to have this chance to talk about assisted suicide litigation that I'm now a plaintiff in. And for folks who don't know, uh, the case is challenging the discriminatory assisted suicide laws that violate the, assisted, the Federal Americans with Disabilities Act and the federal constitution, among other things. Um, and the question I know most people will have is, how dare we do that? And we dare because we know that everyone reaches the end of life. And the end of life is itself disabling. And we don't think that substandard medical care uh, for disabled people should be written into law. And that's what assisted suicide laws do. Now, Alice, you are an accomplished author and editor in a field that you've helped to define called cripplet. And that's a term that was first coined by disabled novelist, Nicola Griffith. You are also a trained health policy researcher, which was how I met you, and a gifted community organizer who founded the Disability Visibility Project. You also have really good hair. You have excellent taste in lip color. You have even better taste in snacks. And you have a wicked sense of humor. And most importantly, an even better heart. You've convinced me once upon a time to finally start using a wheelchair. They're my crippy sister of a couple of decades and my personal commander, Adama. And if you'll pardon my language, you inspire me every day to write honestly, sleep more, choose the finest cured meats, and snark like there's no tomorrow. Because over the last couple of years, you and I have both had health crises that could have killed us. And especially with suicide laws lurking about, that's kind of scary. But with us, it's nothing but good times. So since Jerry Lewis, once upon a time, insisted that you and I were both half a person, Alice, you truly complete me. Welcome. Ingrid, if I'm Commander Ajama from Battlestar Galactica, I am the Psylon version of Ajama. That's a little something for the nerds out there. I met you when I first moved out to San Francisco in the ancient times, the late 1990s. We both attended a hearing on reproductive health care for disabled women in Sacramento, and I saw you on the sidewalk as I was headed home. At that time, most of the disabled people I knew were in the East Bay, so I was thrilled that you were an SF like me. And thus, a snarky crip friendship was born. We've both been through a lot and it's well that we have not seen each other in three years, but hey, we are alive and have fought so hard to be here at this moment right now. There's something about disabled friendships like ours where you can share the darkest, most vulnerable parts about our lives without judgment or fear. I just want to say, I realize it's kind of strange that we're sitting here talking about assisted suicide laws and I'm smiling so much, but uh, it's just so good to see your face. I don't know what else to do. Um, is it okay if I stipulate for the record um, that both of us have muscular dystrophy, but of different sorts, and that each of our types is neuromuscular, it's progressive, meaning it gets worse, and degenerative. I think we know what that means. We're degenerates. Um, we can stipulate that we're both of a generation that's among the first to have readily survived to middle age, which is where we both are in life, and that we are definitely giving our continued survival a big thumbs up. And that like L'Oreal hair care products everywhere, we're worth it when it comes to resources. <laughs> Can you give a, a big so say we all? So say we all. 
I'll also add that when I was a kid, I never expected to live past 30. That's what the doctors and my parents told me so I could not imagine my future. What a way to grow up. Do you know that I only just got a precise diagnosis a couple years ago in my 50s after three misdiagnoses in my life? Um, and I thank God that I live long enough um, to find out that I have a typical life expectancy. Um, imagine if I believed the hype from the telethons in all those years. Um, I'd be like Eric Idle in the meeting of life, you know, the part where he's going out the door with the Grim Reaper. And then he says, oh, my God, I never even had the salmon moose. <laughs> OK, anyway, um, I'm pretty sure that you and I also agree that uh, having muscular dystrophy, yes, it can be a pain in the ass. And it definitely rides around town in a clown car of access barriers. But while all of this informs our analysis of how assisted suicide legislation violates the ADA and civil rights protections, we're not here to, at today or at any time to slag on people who do desire assisted suicide. We know that there are reasons why people come to feel like suicide is a solution, not a problem. And that's when disability is involved. So assisted suicide itself um, actually felt desirable to me and so, so rational when I was hospitalized recently and couldn't figure out any good options for my own future. So I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. The point though is that we're here today to talk about legislation, laws. I would never hurt my spouse, for example, by coercing them into dying prematurely. But there are families who do take advantage of their disabled loved ones, who do abuse them, and who will find doctors willing to help them. Laws are meant to just protect the many from the few, and our assisted suicide legislations just don't do that. We really can't look at assisted suicide laws, though, um, in isolation. Can you talk about the systemic issues that can, that themselves create a hunger for suicide? How do eugenics and systemic ableism contribute to the support for assisted suicide laws? Especially in light of how when the pandemic hit, um, gaps in the healthcare system and lack of safeguards, understanding and value for our community, um, they were all exposed in a new way. Um, medical rationing and ranking people according to their quality of life scores um, are just some of the ways that disabled people continue to be left with the short end of the stick. Now, I would love to hear from you. I'm, I'm so glad you asked me that because we can't talk about assisted suicide without talking about how our society is built on white supremacy and ableism in addition to other forms of oppression. Eugenics is not a relic of the past. The state and other institutions have been trying to eliminate us for centuries. The eugenics movement sought to prevent some people with mental illness or physical disabilities from being able to have children. California had the nation's largest forced sterilization program, sterilizing about 20,000 people beginning in 1909, and the program didn't end until 1979. Many of the women sterilized were incarcerated or black, Latinx, and indigenous women, and of course disabled women. The pandemic revealed to the public how some groups of people are considered disposable by the state such as older, disabled, chronically ill, and immunocompromised people. And if you're poor or a person of color and disabled, you are even more disproportionately impacted. California, for example, the prioritized vaccine distribution for high-risk people when supply first came available. Governor Newsom considered an age-based vaccine rollout which would have been devastating for high-risk disabled people. 
Healthcare systems had crisis standards of care and triage protocols that evaluated those who were worthy of treatment for COVID and some explicitly stated that disabled people and other people with high risk factors are not worthy of their allocation of resources due to the likelihood they may not recover compared to quote unquote healthy people. For example, the Office of Civil Rights required the state of Alabama to fully rescind guidance excluding people with intellectual disabilities, dementia, and others from ventilator access. Healthcare rationing has always existed and many prominent bioethicists have argued that it is a waste of resources to care for disabled people based on perceived quality of life. Mind you, these measures of quality of life standards are based on a deficit model and do not take into account social determinants of health such as social supports and economic privilege. Medical bias is obliged and racist and we have always been at the short tippy tip of the stick way before the pandemic. This is why many marginalized people have a valid distrust and fear of the medical industrial complex that perceives us as non-compliant or malingers or wasteful expenditures or purely in terms of a set of problems that cannot be fixed. Privilege is when you go into the ER or see a doctor and don't feel dehumanized or the need to fight for the bare minimum. Assisted suicide, in my mind, is a new addition to a doctor's toolbox on what they can offer disabled people to relieve their quote-unquote suffering. It's a solution to a problem that they can't figure out which is why assisted suicide is so incredibly seductive and appealing to many. In a country where profits come before people, the healthcare system is set up to mitigate their financial risk by limiting or denying care to people like you and me who are considered useless eaters, which is a phrase from Nazi Germany that rings true today. Disabled people are up against so many structural and societal pressures that seek to erase and eliminate us. I feel despair and am overwhelmed when I see so much systemic violence and ableism, and yet I witness every day how disabled brilliance is changing the world whether the world recognizes it or not. And this is what drives much of my work. Well, thank God for much of your work, and of course for you as well. Um, You know, and to emphasize the thing about the vaccine rollout, um, I came home from the hospital uh, with oxygen in January in 2021. Um, and one of my doctors, one of the ones I really felt great about, um, had said that COVID would be 100% fatal for me. Um, and when he tried to get me approved then uh, for the vaccine right away, um, the system wouldn't let him. Um, people like us with serious respiratory weaknesses were not approved for life-saving protection from a respiratory illness. Um, that's how the system operates for disabled people, and it's the one that we're now told we can absolutely trust at, at the end of our lives. And it, for me, what it shows, though, is how you having even a really good doctor doesn't mean that I'm protected from discriminatory public policy. You recently went through health emergencies and hospitalizations yourself. Has that deepened your understanding of healthcare discrimination and how it speaks to issues like assisted suicide laws? Last June, I went through a number of medical crises that resulted in four weeks in the ICU. It was the most harrowing time of my life. I am no longer able to speak or eat, which is a huge bummer, but what really burns my biscuits is how I had to constantly advocate and reassert myself in the midst of trying to stay alive. My two sisters were there by my side and relayed my wishes, but even with them it was a struggle to be truly seen and heard in my weakened and vulnerable state. 
As I was preparing to be discharged from the hospital, I was brought to the brink when I discovered how difficult it was going to move back home because of my new intensive care needs. The discharge planner basically said that because I am on Medicaid and the lack of providers who could care for me at home, my only options were to have family care for me 24-7 or that I should go into a subacute facility with the closest one in another city. It was the only time I cried during my entire hospital stay. I actually considered it because I didn't think I had any options and knew it was unsustainable to rely on my family indefinitely. While I say many times that disabled people are not burdens, we actually are burdens in the eyes of the state, authorities, and major institutions. And this is a type of self-coercion which is so toxic and destructive even if you want to live, which is wild if you think about it. There's no amount of individual will that can withstand that much pressure from yourself and the systems you are enmeshed in. When you are exhausted, scared, stressed out, and isolated, it is very easy to consider an option like assisted suicide or institutionalization as the most logical and convenient choice. And when I say choice I actually mean it's a false choice because scarcity, as legal scholar Sam Bagentos wrote, is a construct. Scarcity is a choice by the state and they are trying to con us into believing we are not worthy to breathe the same air and exist in the same space as everyone else. It's effed up beyond belief. Exactly. The times when you are the most exhausted, scared, stressed out, sick, and isolated are the same times when our system requires us to fight for ourselves the heart. I, I mean, it's absurd and it's cruel and it's something a lot of people just don't want to have to look at because it scares them quite legitimately. It was the prospect of, of me having to go to a skilled nursing facility, also called a SNF, um, that for me was what made assisted suicide start looking like a desirable option, however briefly. You know, it was the quote unquote logic of a person in a burning building deciding to get out, you know, like it's a choice, like you said. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I would actually be safer without medical care than with the substandard medical care they were, they were offering. Um, and that happened to me when I was in the middle of a severe depressive episode. Um, I had just had the hospital's neurologist uh, tell me that they don't usually send patients with progressive conditions like mine to the rehab center because as you alluded to, um, they had this standard of recovery that was just not applicable to me. Um, when I questioned that, he gestured to me lying in the hospital bed, you know, wearing an oxygen mask and in acute emotional distress, which he knew about, and said, well, look at you. You've always known this was coming. This has been coming for a long time. And, you know, there's nothing we can really do about it. And that was such a gut punch. Um, it bypassed my brain. It was in the gut. Because I know that I have a degenerative condition. You know, I wasn't expecting to start tap dancing. Um, but hearing that there's nothing we can do about it, to me, it sounded like we had given up on my survival. I'd had many doctors before be honest with me about the limits of what they could do, but this was different. Um, and it sounded like he thought whatever was going on with me was actually my fault. Like I hadn't tried hard enough to take care of myself. And if I had, I wouldn't be here at the end of the road. And that unfortunately led to an extended kind of attack that lasted for the better part of the night. Um, I was, I mean, I knew 
in my gut that death was there. And it made me make plans to say goodbye to my nieces and nephews in the middle of the night and make me prepare to talk to my husband the next day about coming home to die. Um, I accepted assisted suicide as a viable option um, because it was better than getting COVID in a skilled nursing facility. Um, anyway, yada yada. I survived due to individually wonderful health professionals, because there were many good ones, um, and most definitely my own luck and my privilege as a white, college educated, um, English speaking person. Um, all of those were helping me along. But most importantly, it was probably my husband because I had him and his wholehearted devotion um, that, you know, included him cheerfully changing my diapers when I came home instead of going to his a skilled nursing facility. And all that helped me slowly, very slowly heal um, because I had access to physical therapy and I had psychiatric meds that worked for me and psychotherapy, um, all of to manage my various chronic health conditions. Um, that's a lot of privilege in one thing. Um, and it's ridiculous that me having my multiple health needs met makes me an outlier in the disability communities. Um, what happens to me demonstrates how vulnerable even I was to a suboptimal doctor uh, combined with the possible need of going to a skilled nursing facility. So legislation on assisted suicide that was happening everywhere, not just in the U.S. Um, what have you learned from legislation in other countries and, um, and the response from disabled people? I've been following and learning from disabled people from Canada, such as Gabrielle Peters about Bill C-7, a medical aid and dying bill. This bill removes the safeguards for physician-assisted suicide, amending the current code to allow people who are not terminally ill to die with assistance from a doctor. As I understand it, and I could be wrong, the bill expanded the criteria on who is eligible, including people with a range of disabilities who are not terminally ill. Disabled people from Canada were very active protesting the passage of that bill. They wrote op-eds, testified to their local governments, and organized online to get the public to understand how easily this can be abused and used to coerce people who are living in poverty or not getting the supports they need into thinking they have no other choice. Again, there's that word choice. And terms such as freedom and dignity have been co-opted into campaigns in support of assisted suicide which glosses over the structural inequalities that clearly disadvantage marginalized communities. Unfortunately, this bill passed but the government announced in early 2023 a temporary exclusion of medical aid and dying for people with the sole criteria of having a mental illness. Can you believe in Canada it could become completely legal for any person with a mental illness to be killed by a doctor? I find laws like this and ones in countries like the Netherlands, Switzerland, Germany, Australia and in some states in the United States abhorrent and unconscionable. And we're talking about more than a slippery slope. We're talking about a steep descent into an oblast abyss with no return in sight. Ingrid, can you tell me about the potential litigation on assisted suicide laws? What is your role in this litigation and why did you get involved in DARE, I say, offer yourself as tribute? Okay, well, I hereby offer myself as tribute from District 0.5. Well, okay, so what I am is one named plaintiff um, in the civil rights complaint 
being brought against uh, the state of California uh, that challenges the passage of physician assisted suicide legislation as a matter of law. Um, it's not a suit against a medical facility. Um, it's being brought because everyone deserves protection under the law and they deserve equal access to health care that meets their needs. That's why I want the Americans with Disabilities Act enforced when it comes to, end, to everyone's end of life. Um, disabled people, like everyone, um, already have the legal right to decide their own advanced directives. They have the right to refuse medical treatment at any time. And they have the right to palliative sedation in all 50 states. Although many people remain unaware of what that even is. Even medical providers are often unfamiliar with it. These though are responsible public policies and responsible medical treatments for everyone, not just disabled people. You know, I decided to become one of the plaintiffs because assisted suicide laws to me are the four pintos of healthcare legislation. They're unsafe at any speed. And for anybody who's too young to know what I just said meant, what it means is this. Ford Motor Company didn't recall their pintos, despite knowing that a certain percentage of the vehicles had faulty wiring and would explode. They knew the design was flawed, but they decided that it would be cheaper to do nothing and pay out settlements to the percentage of grieving families they could predict. But you know what? I just realized assisted suicide laws aren't even as good as a Ford Pinto. Because at least with a Ford Pinto, it wasn't just one class of people in at risk. Everyone understood, I think, um, that people blowing up with their cars was unacceptable. Um, even when there was a cost benefit analysis supporting the company's decision to let it. So basically, leaving all this car business out of it, I want us to feel safer inside the medical system than outside it, bottom line. The same healthcare system that denies people a procedure or pain relieving medication, or that loses their records or misdiagnoses them, or that simply admits, you know, I'm so sorry, the system won't let me help you, is going to be the same system that implements assisted suicide laws. And I don't know anybody who hasn't been through at least one of those situations. I imagine the worst doctors I've met, and there have been a few. And I remember that the main purpose of assisted suicide legislation, as it has always been written, is to protect them by lowering this medical standard of care only with this one procedure. Um, and it indemnifies them when they make a mistake, which they will, because no system's operation is ever free of human error. The other thing is that assisted suicide legislation is a bait and switch for healthcare consumers. They're sold on this vision of dying that's controlled and safe. Um, but what you actually get is a prescription for legal drugs that don't always work as you expect. And under the law, there's no required provision of you know, care or even assistance. You get a prescription and an absent physician who has no accountability regarding your welfare. That's it. The most of all I want is to see it's a suicide legislation for what it really is. The painful proof that many people fear death less than not being able to escape our broken health care system. This calls for enforcing our disability rights and strengthening medical standards, not undermining them and calling it choice. Alice, I've been talking about what I'm against, you know, when it comes to assisted suicide laws. 
Can you describe what you're for when it comes to legal protections for quality end of life care? What rights do you wish more people knew about before they reach the end of life? A few months before the pandemic, my parents and I wrote our advance directives. For mine, I was very mindful of the language around what my wishes were if I was unable to make medical decisions on my own. I asserted that I am someone who wants to live and agree to cease treatment under certain circumstances. I also made sure my family knew of my wishes. I want to live in a world where people get all the pain relief and palliative care they need without concern of cost. I want to live in a world where it's okay to be honest about suffering and vulnerability without fear of being institutionalized or euthanized. I want to live in a world where each person can decide what constitutes a good death free of coercion. I want to live in a world that doesn't see weakness, aging, or disability as fates worse than death. What I just shared are not rights or anything that can be codified by law, but they speak to a larger need to change how we value one another and approach care as a collective responsibility rather than a commodified product. So I'm not exactly answering your question, but that's all I got. Uh, I don't know if it's the right answer, but I really liked it. Um, and I will say that with you, I'm with you because I think we need to um, we need to reweave the social safety net in a big way, um, and I'm concerned that we've forgotten that there even is supposed to be one. I can't tell you how happy I am that we had this chance to like share what we think and feel with each other and with other people. Um, that's all I can really say. I'm uh, just so glad we're both here and that I think we're going to be around for a while. So I think that's good news. Thanks for having me, old friend. Live long and prosper. <laughs>